Four males are diagnosed as autistic for every one female. But does this reflect a true biological difference, or are there gender biases in diagnosis? Stay tuned. Welcome back to Psy vs. Psy, where autism is one of our special interests. One of the first things you are likely to learn about autism is that it is far more common in boys than girls. That is, people assigned male at birth are about four times more likely to be diagnosed with autism than those assigned female. Now, there are two possibilities for this pattern of results, both of which make a huge difference in how we understand autism. Now, the first possibility is that autism really is more prevalent in boys. After all, there are other conditions like color blindness that are more common in boys because they have a gimpy Y chromosome. You get one copy of each chromosome from each parent. Girls have two copies of the X chromosome, which means if they get one with a gene for colorblindness, chances are the other one will have the typical genes and they will not be colorblind. But if dad pulls a prank and gives you that janky Y chromosome, there's no spare copy of those genes, so you're stuck with whatever mom gave you. Now maybe autism works like this, we don't really know for sure what the etiology of autism is, we don't know what causes it. Differences in hormones like testosterone, genes, brain anatomy, and so on may all have an influence, but so far there hasn't been a single unifying cause of autism that's been discovered, despite people looking for it. In any case, it could be that males are more likely to be diagnosed because they actually are more likely to be autistic. But think of the other possibility. What if autism is equally prevalent in boys and girls and the difference we see actually reflects gender biases? If this is true, it has profound consequences, as it suggests that for every one female out there diagnosed with autism, there are up to three more that may be undiagnosed. They may be struggling to understand why they are different from other people, why they can't conform to neurotypical expectations despite their best efforts, and are likely to have anxiety, depression, suicidal ideations. If they've sought mental health support, they're probably misdiagnosed with other disorders and maybe on medications that probably don't work, might make things worse, or have dangerous side effects. Now my back of the napkin calculations would put a rough number between five and six million women in the US that are in this situation. I'm trying to convince you that it is absolutely critical that we get this right. So how might we have gotten it wrong? There are two major places where bias can creep in. Recognition by caregivers that the person should be assessed, and then second, in the diagnostic process itself. The recognition bias could reflect the way we treat different genders growing up. In the US at least, boys are given a lot of room to be themselves. Boys will be boys is usually something you hear right after your nephew gets into the candles and nearly burns the house down. But girls are expected to conform, be quiet, not complain, and they're tossed into the deep end of the social pool almost right away, having to navigate a complex social and relational world. Now I'm trying to stay on target here, but there's a whole interesting field of research on socialization, gender, and aggression that probably warrants its own video. I'll summarize with the following. Boys will break your things, but girls will ruin your reputation. What this means is that girls, even if the tests are not biased, may be socialized to mask their symptoms and not ask for the support they need when they need it, or simply learn that no one's going to listen to them or believe them anyway. One telling result is that the gender discrepancy is much larger for individuals with normal to high IQ, as much as nine males for every one female diagnosed. Now, this is a much smaller male to female gap among individuals with low IQ. This is a big red arrow pointing toward testing bias, in my opinion. Those girls have learned to effectively adapt and hide their autism, but at great personal cost. The second source of bias is in the testing and assessment processes, which might make diagnosing males easier. Now, I've heard people claim the current tests were developed with white cisgender males in mind, and I do see this issue raised in scholarly context, and all there's room for a little nuance here. It's true that the current gold standards for assessment do not include attention to sociocultural expectations about gender norms. Girls tend to have quicker developing speech than boys, and delayed speech is a big early marker for autism. In other words, the tests could be biased. There's good reason to think that we might be massively underdiagnosing women, and that is a big problem.
Now, there are a ton of things we could talk about here that are relevant, including literature that purports to identify sex differences in brain anatomy. Stay on target. Or that examine whether there is or isn't a bias in testing. Stay on target. But today I want to share two recent articles that approach this problem in very different ways, but come to the same conclusions. Again, we know that bias is likely to affect who gets brought in to be assessed in the first place. A major limitation on research using people diagnosed with autism already is that the bias may actually select for a biased sample of autistic people, such that comparing diagnosed males and females is like comparing apples to oranges. So any study that uses current diagnosis ratios or compares diagnosed males to females is going to be fraught with problems. Both of the studies I'm going to share came up with ways to get around this problem. The first study I wanted to share with you is McCrossan 2022, which was published in February of this year and used a mathematical approach to approximate the true gender balance. McCrossan operates a private practice that serves autistic individuals and uh, examined histories of ASD children and their parents to try and find the true gender ratio. The argument goes like this. If you have one person in the family diagnosed, people start to realize there are others who meet the criteria. Parents, siblings, and so on are easier to recognize as autistic once you know more about autism. Since families have both genders in them and with equal probability, looking at the other undiagnosed family members can tell you what the real ratio is. For the first person brought in to be assessed, you get that big gender difference, three or four boys for every one girl. But what if you looked at the siblings, both boys and girls, would you get the same ratio? If brothers and sisters are equally likely to be diagnosed, that suggests a strong bias in recognition of autism rather than a true gender difference. So, McCrossin set out to examine the family reports and histories of 1,711 children under the age of 18 and look for biases in diagnosis and estimate the number of undiagnosed males and females. Any difference between the ratio of males to females diagnosed with the first or only child in a family compared to the male and female ratio of other members of the family should reflect a bias against the recognition of autism. Through crunching the numbers of this sample, McCrossin estimated that 75% of autistic girls are never brought in for ASD testing. And for those that are, 20% are missed in the diagnosis. In other words, 79% of autistic females go undiagnosed. Furthermore, the estimates of the male to female ratio in this study wasn't four to one or three to one you see when looking at the biased estimates. Instead, the unbiased estimate was three to four. That is females in this case actually outnumbered the males. Now, there are some caveats to this, and as always, I encourage you to go to the source linked in the description and explore it yourself. For example, in this case, there's a single clinician doing most of the diagnostic confirmations here. Uh, some of the calculations used to estimate the overall ratio require reliance on the prevalence of other disorders like borderline personality disorder. BPD is a problem in part because often women are misdiagnosed with BPD who actually are autistic, and there may be some other issues with BPD in particular. So there may be some constructive arguments about the specific details, and much of that is addressed in the paper as well. But I liked the approach of using family members to get a less biased sample. And I'm not surprised that the actual male to female ratio was far more balanced than we thought. It's also a scary thing because it suggests we are massively underdiagnosing autism in women. If you didn't find that approach convincing, here's another paper from this year, Burroughs et al. 2022, which was just made available this past month online. Now this paper has like 22 authors on it, which is kind of wild. <laughs> but anyway, they took a different approach by assessing autism symptoms in very early development, starting as early as six months of age. Typically, autism isn't diagnosable until 18 to 36 months, with most kids being diagnosed at more like five years old. But researchers have been studying infants who have older siblings diagnosed with ASD and have been able to identify some early signs of autism. In this study, researchers found babies who were deemed high likelihood for autism due to diagnosis of an older sibling and tested them at various time points from six months to five years old. They then used a mathematical technique to match groups of infants together, clustering those who had performed similarly in the test that they gave them. 
Not only did the researchers find clusters that had heightened issues related to social communication and restricted and repetitive behaviors, those are the two major diagnostic categories for autism, Across the board, the researchers found that females and males were classified into these groups at nearly equal rates. Whereas typical diagnostic tools identify autism in 12% of females and 30% of males tested, this study found 30% of females and 32% of males as having high social concerns, a near even split. This suggests we need to adjust our diagnostic criteria to better serve women and girls who've been missed by the current system. So what do I make of all of this? It goes to show how much we're still learning what autism is and how to characterize it. And we need to keep an open mind for that new research that's just over the horizon from what we can currently see. That said, my gut tells me that we're doing a lot of people a disservice, especially women, by diagnosing them with a bunch of stuff they don't have and meanwhile not giving them the support or acceptance they really need. That's why we need people like you to learn more about what autism really is, and not just some stereotypes, and how to support autistic people. To help with that, we've got a neurodiversity playlist, which I'll link to below and at the end of this video. There are so many related topics that it's hard to stick to just one in a single video, and gender can be complicated, especially among autistics. Would you want to see a video on how autistic people may have a different experience of gender compared to neurotypicals? Or what about issues of race and autism? Leave a comment with what we should explore next. Hit the like button and subscribe to help us grow our channel. And until next time, keep thinking. Braden, you put that down. Aiden, don't touch that. Jaden, Jaden, that does not go in the mouth. Boys will be boys. Jennifer, did you just roll your eyes at me? Come here. Come here. <laughs>